Welcome to our worship service for this fourth Sunday of Lent. We are grateful that you've chosen to worship with us today. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. God's, God's mercy, mercy endures, endures forever. forever. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have, we have erred and strayed from, from thy ways like lost sheep. We have, we have followed, followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread, that Jesus may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Numbers. From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The Word of the Lord.
A reading from the Gospel according to John. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come to the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. But all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of the Lord. Along with many of you and many throughout the world, I've been thinking about vaccinations, vaccinations against the coronavirus, and I feel enormously privileged to have had my first injection already. The thought that everyone in America who wants an injection will have been able to have one by the end of May is enormously encouraging as we think about what it's going to take for us to be able to, to regather safely in greater numbers than we're able to do at the moment. But along with all of this hope, there are also a plethora of articles uh, talking about vaccine inequity and how uh, first world countries are often hoarding, perceived as hoarding the vaccines and make it harder for others to get. Uh, there are inequities within our own country in terms of uh, continuing health. And I'm pleased that the District of Columbia prioritizes uh, zip codes where there are a greater number of people who are, at, who, are at, who are at risk for the virus. This is not a case where the cure is worse than the ailment, but it serves as a reminder that there's still a lot of work to be done if we are to ever to see a more just society uh, at home and mutually beneficial relationships across the globe. Biblical scholar uh, N.T. Wright calls justice uh, along with other themes like love and beauty and freedom, he calls justice a signpost, but a broken signpost. He has a book called Broken Signposts, uh, How Christianity Makes Sense of the World. And in it, he writes, the instinct for justice runs deep. You don't have to have a master's degree in philosophical ethics to know what it's all about. It's a universal human sense. That isn't right that something needs to be done to put it right. And a few paragraphs later, he writes, he writes this. In other words, we find that justice serves as a signpost pointing toward what is foundational or essential to our lives. And at the same time, we find that it's a broken signpost. For no matter how hard we strive to live up to the, ide the ideal, we fail often in ways that create more injustice. As with the other themes in the book, he takes the Gospel of John as a sort of conversation partner. And in a reading of John, the signpost of, of, of justice, battered though it may be, especially through the kind of kangaroo courts which pass for Jesus's trials, this broken justice is finally put to rights in John's eyes when a new creation is accomplished. And that new creation is accomplished in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. In our reading from John chapter 3 today, John points to the crucifixion and the resurrection uh, as Jesus being lifted up and exalted. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. I'll get back to vaccines in a bit, but let's spend a minute with this extraordinary reference to the book of Numbers and the story of Moses lifting up a snake. Uh, lifting up a snake, what, which might seem like a totem or a symbol with, with magical properties that we would not expect at all to be pleasing to Yahweh. The story in Numbers, which we heard, 
is when the, further, when the former slaves who were in the wilderness uh, were there, they complained bitterly and frequently. We don't have enough food. God gives them manna. We don't have water. The water comes out of the rock and so on. And, and in this instance, something different happens. They're not just complaining against Moses. They are speaking against Moses and against God. And that, that's for the first time. So God sends fiery serpents, seraphs, um, uh, venomous snakes, and they, they bite people and people start to die. And the people realize that their blasphemy has consequences and, and dire consequences of life and death at that. And they repent and they come to Moses and Moses prays for them. And God tells him to make a copper snake and put it on a stick and hold it up. Uh, and the people who gaze on that snake will find themselves healed. You might very well think that this is uh, an idol. And in fact, 500 years later, it's still around and King Hezekiah realizes there are people worshiping it and has it broken in two and destroyed because it had become a sign of, uh, sign of uh, that, that which was venomous became a sign of the anti-venom and of healing. The healing, of course, was a gift of Yahweh. And as people lifted their eyes to the snake on a pole, so at best they would have seen something like an icon, both of the wrath of God and the love of God. And so back to Jesus' intriguing conversation with Nicodemus in the dead of night and the theme of light overcoming the darkness in the world. Here on the fourth Sunday in Lent, both Good Friday and Easter are being foreshadowed in what is Jesus' first prediction of his passion in this gospel. Why must the Son of Man be lifted up? Why must the Son of Man be lifted up? So that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Look at the serpent and live. Believe in the Son of Man and live eternally. Barbara Brown Taylor has written, if the people believed that the bronze serpent was responsible for their cure, then that snake was an idol and Hezekiah was right to snap it in two. But if looking up at the serpent reminded the people to lift their hearts to God, then the snake was a sacrament. Looking up at it, they looked through it to their only physician, who alone was their health, their salvation and their cure. Well, just so with John's understanding of Jesus, the Son of Man offers not just life, but eternal life. And looking on Jesus is not enough. We must believe in Jesus. And for John, that's an action verb. It's not intellectual assent to, uh, to some propositions. It means being wholehearted for Jesus. It means believing, putting one's whole trust in God's grace and love in a way that makes a fundamental difference to how we live in the world. Eternal life is not, in John's, when John talks about eternal life, he's not talking about pie in the sky when you die. It's about quality of life today. And I try and get at this when I talk about abundant life as the promise of the gospel. Promise and possibility of abundant life, I'm trying to get at God's, John's intent when he talks about eternal life. And so back to vaccines. This is not true of the coronas, coronavirus vaccines, but older virus vaccines often worked by injecting uh, just, just enough uh, pathogen for us to be able to develop antibodies. Just enough uh, in, in older vaccines, the venomous snake, in a sense, is also the source of the antivenom, a source of healing. In a similar kind of move, John is suggesting that Jesus' death will become the means to abundant life. The why of Jesus' death, why is it set up this way, is answered in one of the most beloved and famous verses in all of scripture. Why did Jesus have to die? Because God so loved the world that God gave Jesus so that everyone who believes may not perish, but may have abundant life. God so loved the world that God gave Jesus so that everyone who believes may not perish, but may have abundant life. So as Holy Week <clears throat> and Easter approach, thank God for vaccines. Thank God for the promise 
of a renewal of life in some form when we can regather safely beyond lockdowns. But keep lifting your eyes to the cross. Keep looking past the cross to the source of life, to the source of healing, to the source of abundant life today and forever. For in, in gazing on the cross in, the, in these last weeks in Lent, we can recognize anew the mystery of costly grace and Jesus' absolute integrity and how they're embodied in him and how they, by his choices, open the possibility for us of abundant life today, an abundant life in an ever more just world and abundant life forever in the world to come. I offer this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, hear our prayers. We pray for the whole church, all lay leaders and ministers, and all the holy people of God. Wash us through and through. And cleanse us from our sins. We pray for our nation, for all the nations of the earth, and for all who govern and judge. Purge us from our sin. And we shall be pure. We pray for those who hunger, those who thirst, those who cry out for justice, those who live under the threat of terror, and those without a place to lay their heads. Make them hear of joy and gladness. That those who are broken may rejoice. We pray for those who are ill, those in pain, those under stress, and those who are anxious or lonely. We pray for all who suffer, especially Adrian Allison, Lars Hansen, Ellie Potter, Jed Dozier, Barbara Morrison, Harry Keenan, and Chilton and Dan Knudsen. Give them the joy of your saving help. And sustain them with your bountiful spirit. In this season of Lent, we pray for those who are preparing for baptism and confirmation in God's church, especially Audrey Cunningham and Heather Lett. We pray that with them we may all be granted the grace and strength to repent, turn toward what really matters, and grow closer to God. Create in us clean hearts, O Lord. And renew a right spirit within us. We pray for all the millions around the world who have died of the coronavirus and the millions more who mourn the loss of spouse or partner, mother or father, friend, relative or coworker. In our own circle of prayer, we remember especially Ruth Merriman, Michael Knudsen and Steve Bergen. May they enter into the land of eternal light in your abiding peace. Cast them not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from them. Lord Jesus, you taught your disciples that we can give nothing in return for our lives. Grant us the strength and grant us the wisdom to be your followers, to take up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow you this day and always. Amen. 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 Praying in the words our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will, will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. We welcome you again to these uh, worship services, online worship services for the, for, for the fourth Sunday of Lent. If you are 
watching this on, on the YouTube video, you'll see a link to our parish welcome card. We'd love to hear about, uh, about where you are in your journey in faith. Recently, we learned from Jeffrey, who oversees our newcomer ministry, that our newest member uh, lives outside of Syracuse, New York. One of the blessings of this new way of being church is that our community is growing across, across uh, uh, time, but certainly across uh, a distance. Thank you very much for your generous offerings to our parish. One, one note um, about the generosity of the people of St. Albans. We recently had our, our uh, highest mustard seed on record. It was a collection to uh, provide emergency uh, relief to uh, children and families from our schools in Atiaba, South Sudan, and also in Zarka, Jordan. Uh, your generosity totaled over $18,000 that will be divided equally among those two schools. We are so grateful for your generosity to uh, this parish. It, it, it enables us to do wonderful work in Washington, D.C., in the United States of America, and indeed around the world. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. I I be Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us now and remain with us forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.